Felix here and welcome to this Friday live stream, the last one before Christmas. And what the heck is happening this morning? Well, we get the most important inflation metric of the year coming out in four minutes. And it's the Fed's favorite inflation measure. It's called PCE inflation. It's uh, been significantly lower than CPI inflation. And what we really want to see is if those two match up again, because typically they do. And if they did match up again with the lower CPI reading we had, that would be a boon for the market and Santa Claus might come to town yet. And you might hear me singing and, and, and dancing and all sorts. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, Felix, Na Felix Navidad says, Robert, uh, that's a nice one. You know, no one's ever, ever come up with that before. That's a, that's, a, that's a really good one. Good one. So let me just... Um, keep this open here with you. Let me put my screen up. Of course, none of the following is financial advice. You know that by now I aim to give you insight, education, data, but always come to your own conclusions. Don't just follow some strange man on uh, YouTube blindly with his collar sticking out on one side, you see, barely dressed. Um, this is literally what we're waiting for. We're going to just stare at the screen for the next three minutes and, uh, and, and, and freak out. But no, we're not going to do that. Uh, what I want to show you actually is this is a Bloomberg chart. And in blue on here, you've got CPI inflation, which is you and me inflation, consumer inflation, consumer price inflation. That's CPI. And then in white, do we have a white pen, Microsoft? No, no white pen. Somebody talk to somebody at Microsoft. A white pen would be marvelous. So that there is PCE. And what can you see? Well, you can hopefully see, and I'll zoom in on this, that there is a monster gap between the two. The biggest gap we've seen in quite a long period of time. The last time we had such a gap of such magnitude, I guess... Yeah, I guess it was 2008, 2009 here. And at that point, CPI then trended down and kind of, sorry, actually inflation picked it. Yeah. PCE actually went up to meet it. And that's, of course, what we don't want. We want the opposite. We want um, PCE to stay low and for CPI to come and meet it. Uh, but at the moment, there's a huge gap there. And, and PCE excludes food and energy, which is a bit of a bit of a random thing. Uh, but that's just the way the Fed does it. Uh, they do love this indicator. So let's watch out for what it comes in out in a minute. It's going to seriously move markets, this thing. So that's really why we're here for. That's also why I showed up a few minutes early. Um, uh, Unai, hello there to Saudi Arabia. Um, vamos, says Unai. Um, appreciate you coming on. Santa rally starting in three minutes. Um, let's hope so. Anticipation is killing me. Uh, indeed. Um, what do you want me to say? Come on, data, give us the data, give us a low. What are we watching out for? The PCI price index month on month and the core PCI price index month on month. We're expecting 0 0.2 and we're expecting 0 0.3. These are the two numbers that we really, really, really care about. Uh, that's what we want to come in. Um, I'm going to highlight them so you know which one to look at. as The data pings in here in, in, in just a second or so. Um, Uh, Una, you want to have a session with me? Um, go to felixfriends.org slash call. Book a call with us, felixfriends.org slash call. Super happy to talk you through it, um, answer all your questions and, and decide whether that's the right thing for you. So links also down below, felixfriends.org slash call. All right, data is coming in. Durable goods orders are coming in really low, much, much lower than expected. Interesting. Recession is here, yes. Um, White House, uh, pay attention to the data. Um, any other data? All the other data is just, um, ah, PCE coming in at 0 0.1. That's lower than expected. That's half what we expected. But core coming in flat from expectations, but still lower than last month. Uh, that's good news. Personal spending slowing down. That is also good news. I'm going to color code these from a stock market point of view. Uh, so this figure here is the one that should make us start dancing and singing. That is significantly lower. Inflation heading towards zero month on month. That's very nice to see. Uh, core PCE is flat, but still lower than last month. I'd still say that is a win from our point of view. And uh, personal income, again, a little higher than expected. So that's a, that's a problem that's inflationary. But uh, durable goods orders falling, is that good or bad? I, I really depends on whether bad news is still good news or whether bad news is finally becoming bad news. 
and I'll explain that if you'd like me to just ask in the chat. Uh, so I'm just going to screenshot this and pop this in here so we can scribble all over it and see this in its glorious detail. This is good news. Uh, lower PCE price inflation than expected. We're expecting 0.2. Last month, it was 0.4. This is the November figure, remember? This data is always a little slow. But let's just pull up a um, futures here. The futures are at our fingertips, thanks to TradingView. That's not a sponsored plug, by the way. I don't do sponsored plugs. I'm not a big fan of those. Uh, so market uh, S&P tanking on this news, which is a little baffling. I might see that coming up again. What about QQQ? QQQ is more rate sensitive. Uh, we got the durable goods numbers earlier. I wonder if that's what's tanking the market here. But the inflation figure should really give us a bit of a boost in my view. But markets work in mysterious ways and bankers particularly work in mysterious ways. So at the moment, the market isn't loving this. The market is falling, which is a little unusual. Why is the market falling? Durable goods is basically saying inflation recession is here. Personal income is saying watch for um, watch for wage spirals. But last month it was 0 0.7 and it's lower than, it's sorry, it's higher than consensus. So this is definitely an inflationary uh, bell there. Uh, JP Morgan is sitting upright in his dressing gown going, gosh, uh, oh dear, what are we going to do about that? We're going to have to make more people unemployed faster. Let's go and do something about that. But lower than expected PCE readings and flat on the core PCE, I would say is a win. But at the moment, the market is definitely not agreeing with me on that one. Uh, let me pull up the S&P futures, also down half a percentage point here. And breaking through that 3835 line again, which is what we went through yesterday, and we talk a lot about that today. That's basically where JP Morgan's collar trade is. And I'll explain a bit more about what they do and how that works and why that moves the market uh, pretty much every month, definitely every quarter. So the data is mixed, in fairness, um, although I, I would think that the inflation numbers are looking good. And, and that collar 3835 expiration. Uh, should give us some stickiness around there, which is exactly what we saw yesterday here. But so far this morning, the market not particularly exuberant about this data, or maybe the bank is a little bit slow to read. Let's see. Let's see if I was right or if I was wrong on that interpretation in the next uh, half hour or, or, or so. Um, the Nasdaq is on track for its worst December drop since 2002. It's not been a particularly good December. Um, I'm not sure why we exclude every other month, but it makes for a pretty chart, doesn't it? Quite festive, the colors here from Bloomberg today. Um, also rather festive. I'm doing a live masterclass uh, for everybody out there with a five-figure portfolio or more. Come and join us at felixfriends.org slash live. You need to sign up for it. It won't be on YouTube. And yes, we are going to run out of spaces. We always do at felixfriends.org slash live. 27th of December, 9 a.m. Eastern. Come and join us. So let me explain a little bit like what's going on with the market here. And I make this as big as possible. So I block as little as possible of it. Um, what have you got? Well, on the on the left hand side of this lovely chart, which is from uh, Spot Gamma, so thanks for that. For that, uh, you have the S S P Y. Okay, let me just find a pen. Microsoft, may I have a pen, please? Apparently, yes. Um, that's great. Wish is granted. What have they done with the blue? Have they changed the blue? So on the left here, you've got the SPY, and then on the right, you've got the SPX, which is the S&P. Both is the S&P 500, essentially. One is the ETF, one is the index. So what have we got? What's the biggie here? The big deal is the 3835 call strike. That's that one there. That's 3835. And that is basically JP Morgan's collar trade we spot it every month it's fairly obvious it's so big that it's hard to overlook they try to kind of hide it but we do always find it it's enormous 47,000 calls or something like that uh, so what what does that mean well it's such an enormous set of calls expiring at the end of the month that it sucks the market towards it it just the market goes below it, it goes back to it. It goes above it, it goes back to it. And that's kind of what we saw yesterday, right? If you look at yesterday, we went, uh, you know, down towards it, hovered around it, hovered around it, went below it, up again, below, up again. Uh, we had a little bit of that rally recovery, then we went down and we went down pretty hard. And then towards the end of the day, we basically moved back towards it. Uh, so that's um, that's the support there. Uh, and then also on the 3,800, there is a huge uh, open expiry 
uh, at 3,800, which gives us support here as well. Um, and then there is a put wall now sitting at 3,775 or 375 if you trade the SPY. So that's the put wall, and the put wall is typically pretty good support. Can, of course, break through supports. They're just indicators, but it certainly held uh, yesterday. So what does that mean? Well, it just means a, a very small thing can flip the market significantly up or below. Uh, but really, the, if you break through 3775, and we didn't yesterday, then, sorry, Christmas is off. Um, you're going to have to eat dry bread, basically. Uh, that's the So that's the downside risk for me. I, and I think that's somewhat greater than the upside risk uh, at the moment. Let's have another look at the market. Market recovering a little bit here. Um, maybe the bankers, somebody explained it to them, like there were five. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the major risk lies on a break of the 3775 in the SPX or 375 on the put wall. Um, Gamma hedging, I'm not going to go into the details of that. I'll, I'll, I'll lose too many viewers if I do. But yeah, that's just the way it works. Um, Moving beyond that for a bit, and we're going to go back to inflation here in a second because that's the big number out. We want to see how the market reacted to it. Uh, on this chart, you've got the US 10 year, the US 10 year, and you've got the NASDAQ. Uh, the 10 year is inverted because they have an inverse correlation. So, what can you see? Well, really, you've got to watch the 10 year if you are interested in trading the NASDAQ or investing in the NASDAQ, because that's the only thing that matters. 10 year goes up, NASDAQ goes down. And they're moving in virtually perfect tandem. They're right here together, uh, dancing, you know, the polka or something. Uh, so 10 year goes up, NASDAQ goes down. 10 year goes down, NASDAQ goes up. It's really very, very simple. And watch for big gaps, because big gaps can sometimes be nice opportunities for, for trading. Now, Tesla is what everyone's talking about. Loads of messages. Twitter is basically now just talking about Tesla and Elon. Uh, that seems to be what it's come to. Tesla is very oversold, really, really, really oversold. Uh, this is as oversold as it is, which is, that's a flat line. So when was the last time we were this oversold? 2015, I want to say. So what does that mean? Well, you can stay oversold for a really, 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 really long time. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to going to bounce back up. But it's starting to look like almost like an attractive trade. Almost, I, 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 would, I would add. Um, unless you think all hell will freeze over with, with, with regards to Tesla. We haven't really done many trades in December, very little, to be honest with you, because um, it hasn't been a very good environment for it. Very, very low liquidity, and that means a lot of risk and not necessarily a lot of upside. So December has been a really, really slow one, as liquidity is like really low, historically very low. So I'm going to wait for Jan for, for really to kick that off again. Uh, but we are up about 140% on the year. If you want to know exactly how I did that and learn exactly how I trade and what the rules are that I have and like my, my protocol and so on, then um, go to felixfrenz.org slash coaching if you have a five or six or seven or eight figure portfolio. Does that mean you're going to get exactly my results? No, of course not. I can't promise you that would be silly, uh, but I can share with you everything that I do and everything that I think of and and and, and my full understanding and, 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 and rules-based system. Because it is a rules-based system, which is super important. If you're just starting out, if you're not quite at five figures yet, then check out felixfrenz.org slash options. It's a 100 lesson plus course. You get to watch me trade live every week. Well, not with this week, because it was a particularly horrific week. Uh, but uh, usually I trade every, every single week, and you can watch that live, and you have access to all the trades and a spreadsheet and so on. So there's a coupon code there. Down link is also down below. Uh, guarantee is that coupon code and it also comes with a 90-day guarantee the course so um it's a it's a risk-free investment in yourself now the phrase is it all priced in i think is one that might come and bite us in the uh, backside in 2023 people are saying that all the fed interest rates are priced in but are they really this is the fastest the fed has ever hiked rates uh, has the market really chewed on that properly is the 10-year yield as high as it should be I have some doubts on that. And I think that's something to really think about, that 2023 has the potential to surprise us with that one. If you look at equity ETFs, so the big ETFs, we are seeing the biggest outflows from equity ETFs since... Well, I was going to say forever, but at least since 2017. At the end of 2021, December 2021, we also had pretty significant outflows. And of course, some of that is going to be tax loss harvesting. So people who have big losses on their positions, they sell them to then 
uh, accrue that loss, it sets it off against their taxes and it's, it's, it's rather beneficial. Um, although much better not to pay any taxes to start with, which is what, is what I would advocate uh, legally. <laughs> you can't do that if you live in the United States, by the way. Um, well, unless you're Donald Trump, but that's a whole different story. So it's significant. Is that all tax loss harvesting or is there something more sinister? Are people actually getting uh, sick and tired of the stock market or are they actually accruing gains? And you might think, who's got gains? Well, people who invested in like 2020 certainly might still have gains depending on what they bought. Uh, this is CNN's um, fear index. We're back to fear. We've been at greed the last week or two and we're back to fear. Are you ready to buy the fear yet? Generally best to buy when there's extreme fear and to sell when there is extreme greed. So it's, it, is an, it is an interesting, useful calculator, uh, indicator rather not calculator. Um, make sure you sign up for our masterclass on the 27th for if you have a five-figure or six-figure or seven-figure or eight-figure portfolio at felixfenster.org slash live. Seats will be limited. Um, we're up to about 500 signups, so there won't be that many more that we'll take up. Uh, so jump on that. Link's also down below in the description. Now, the Fed is... Um, congratulating themselves. They're throwing an extra large Christmas party. Um, not only have they very likely made a lot of people unemployed, but they have also tanked the housing market um, pretty significantly. So what is this showing you? They're showing you the um, projected Fed interest rate hikes, which is this little red line there. So have we ever done something worse? Yeah, in the 80s. In the 1980s, people were crazy, uh, really mad. Uh, uh, and they did it even even, even faster but, uh, and, and, and steeper than what we've done right now. But the housing market, the new home sales, uh, that red line here, let me zoom in on that a little bit for you, is the new house sales. And they have come down significantly, right? They are falling like 25% points it's picked up a little bit here but again you know data is data um so it's kind of falling in line with what we've done in 19 in the 1980s so therefore uh, house prices well uh you know certainly house sales are going to be seriously affected now let's go back a little bit to um here we go there we go you see the market is coming up so i wasn't completely stark raving mad um when i said this it makes sense. Inflation is lower than we expected, and the market is now rallying. Uh, thank you very much, um, which I thought was fairly predictable. But um, there were about five minutes of bankers unsupervised on the loose without their leashes, and uh, they were like, you know, selling things when they should have been buying things. No idea why, to be honest with you. Uh, but the market does strange things sometimes. And that would have been a trading opportunity, in my view, right? If you had an understanding and conviction of what I said at the beginning, and not, not that you should have followed me, but if you come to that conclusion, you could have uh, set up a trade and uh, you could have set it up somewhere down here and you would have made some nice money. Uh, at least if you've done it with some options. Um, uh, James, you've been scalping the ES for some nice gains. Um, brilliant. Are you doing that this morning? That would have been a nice start to the day. Is this the Santa rally in yet? Bahamas doesn't have any income tax. Um, Felix got the hot water back. Indeed, uh, you can't trade successfully without hot water. That's actually my secret. Seriously, uh, hot water. So yeah, markets are now looking um, rather rather green and rather Christmassy, 0.6% up. Is that enough uh, to give us a, a rally? I don't think so um, at this point. A 3866, um, I think we're still going to get pulled towards the sort of 3835 levels here um, because that's just where, where JP Morgan sits and where JP Morgan sits, JP Morgan gets it. And what does that mean? Well, let me show you. I'll do a quick recap and then let's talk about the JP Morgan trade because it is one that does a lot of a lot of stuff to the markets every single month. So it's an interesting thing to understand at least a little bit here. So if you just joined us, guys, um, personal income is coming higher than expected. And that is potentially a wage spiral in the making. And I think that's probably for about five, for about five minutes, the market tanked. Uh, but I thought that the month on month PCE price inflation, which is the Fed's favorite inflation measure coming in, 
50% lower than expected at 0.1%. So that's virtually no inflation at all month on month. And core at 0.2, it's still pretty good. It's less than last month at 0.3. And that's kind of showing inflation is coming down. That's exactly what we want to see um, with a little bit of a, but people are getting paid too much uh, from the perspective of the Fed. And durable goods orders uh, also cataclysmically declining, which is what you would expect going into a recession. What are durable goods? Um, fridges. You know, that sort of thing. You don't necessarily need a new fridge um, as long as the old one still keeps whatever it is that you chill cool. And um, yeah, durable goods orders, excluding transport. Uh, so transport is, is coming down a lot. So people are not buying cars, right? That's a, that's part of the problem there. Durable goods orders, ex-defense. Defense goes into durable goods orders. What sort of monkey banana republic statistician thing do you run there in the US? That's baffling. Uh, so, um, yeah, you want to exclude defense, wouldn't you, at the rate that people are sending things to the Ukraine? So minus 2.6% is probably the more um, the more realistic number on durable goods because defense isn't really something that's part of the real economy. It just depends on a few crazy people in Washington. Uh, so that's that. And then what I keep saying is what we keep getting sucked to is 3,835. That's where the options market sits at the moment. And by the options market, I mean um, JP Morgan. Uh, because the lot at JP Morgan, and let me show you that trade here. Where did it go? Here it is. Uh, JP Morgan's collar trade here. Yeah, I can show it to you live as well on the brokerage. Let me go in here. So at 3.8, and you can literally go into your brokerage. This is Think or Swim. And you can go on to the options chain. So you type in SPX up here. Type in SPX, which is the S&P 500 index. You go into the options chain. Go to the end of the month. They typically trade the quarterly expiry. So at the end of each quarter, hence the December 30th, that's what they trade. And I'll explain to you why they do that. And at 3835, you find all the call options in the world. The left side is call options, 46,000 open interest. And that's staggeringly large volume compared to any other strike price. So that's JP Morgan. They can't really hide that. And then on the right, on the put side, you try to find where their puts are because they sell a call to buy a put. Uh, why do they do that? Hedging, and I'll show you what that looks like as well in a second. Uh, so where is there a lot of volume? 3,750, 3,700, there are 27,000 there. At 3,600, there are 27,000. I've seen a lot of the time, JB Morgan have like three, 400 points in between these. So they can be really, really wide. So I don't know where they're positioned. It could be 3,500, it could be 3,600. Typically, it'll, it'll be a round number. Um, too difficult for them to remember the small numbers in between. You know, bankers, simple minds, and all of that. So probably three, three, five, three, six, three, seven thousand. That's where they are, are positioned. And, and how does that work? Well, they do this every month. They sell a call option to pay for the put. So the put's free. The put is their hedge. So they hedge themselves against downside. So um, I, I did a random setup here. Say they hedged at three thousand seven hundred then without the 3,700 hedge, they would, in theory, have an unlimited loss, right? The S&P could go to whatever, could drop to whatever level, and they wouldn't make any, it would lose a lot of money. This way, they actually get upfront $3,357 cash upfront. And this, this trade doesn't cost them anything. This trade actually, on the face of it, makes them money. And then it reduces, it limits their max loss to only 8,881. And obviously they're doing, you know, 40,000 contracts of this or something. That's a slightly bigger number. Um, and what, what, what's, the, what's the downside? Well, they're giving up some profit. So in theory, you know, as the stock went up, they could make a lot more money. But the stock being the SPX, because they also hold their long, the SPX, they hold 100 shares of the SPX times 40,000 or whatever it might be. So they give up some of the gains uh, and, and in return, they are they, they get to limit their downside. So it means that they don't go out of business if, if the S&P crashes to 3,000 or something. Um, in the long run, this probably doesn't make them any money. This is a drag on, 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 on their performance, but it does protect them. And that's what hedges are for, right? It's, it's, it's that. So they don't just go out and buy a put, which is what they could do. It would cost them money. Instead, they also sell a call and therefore they get a free hedge and um, I think it's a reasonable strategy, honestly. Uh, some people argue it'd be better to just buy some bonds or something like that and diversify, but 
I mean, JP Morgan have been doing this for a long time, so I think they probably know what they're doing. Uh, so, but that's essentially what keeps the market pinned at um, 3835, uh, roughly. Um, if you want to learn some more about how options actually determine the stock market, uh, because they, they do, and they're not some sort of strange leverage to gamble with stocks. I know that's what some people do with it, but that's fairly moronic. Um, really, it's just an asset class on its own, and you can make money irrespective of which way the stock market goes. Uh, and that's why we do what we do. So come and join us if you have a five-figure portfolio or more at Felix Rentalog slash coaching. And if you're just getting started, also brilliant. Uh, I love that. Uh, head over to Felix Rentalog slash options. Join our course. It's 100 Lessons Plus. It's got a 90-day guarantee. You get unlimited, unfettered access to everything. You get to watch me trade live. You see my trades and there's live chat support and everything else as well. And, and use that coupon code guarantee uh, down there. Now, if you have any questions, this is the time to shout them out in the chat. And I will go through them if you asked a question earlier on. I've probably missed it, in which case, repeat it. Uh, will you? Can you please show us um, how to calculate that 63% chance of profit um, using Think or Swim, says Mike? Um, yeah. So you have to basically work out. So say we go to 3835. Five. Um, there is a probability of making money, prop ITM in Single Swim. You can add that using the little setting symbol here if you haven't got it. And that gives you probabilities. So um, what do you need to figure out? You need to figure out your break even on this trade. So say if this was your trade, the one that I screenshotted here, and your break even is 3788, right? 3788. So you find 3788. Um, roughly, and that gives you then, I'll take 3,785 or 790, and you go over and that gives you a probability of being in the money of 62.73%. Mine says 63%, so it's the same number. So um, yeah, you can look it up in, in, in any brokerage. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. You don't need to send the money to option strat. Uh, so uh, Mike, appreciate that question. Um, Jerome says volume is so low on everything. Yeah, Jerome, I think it's time to enjoy your sale and, and probably not do any trades till the end of the year. The 1.7 trillion budget approval, will that add to inflation? Well, 880 billion of that is defense. <laughs> um, so uh, that just keeps people employed. It keeps congressmen happy. You've got defense contractors in their districts and... Um, yeah, it's probably moderately inflationary. Um, I, I would say it is. It seems like complete madness, uh, but there we go. Uh, selling a call to buy a put, what's that strategy called? It's called a collar. It's called a collar. It's it's really, you also need to own the underlying. So it's really a, a hedging strategy. Let me see if there are any other questions. Uh, who's excited for Neo Day indeed tomorrow on Christmas Eve, though? I mean, really? I'm, I'm, I, I, am, I am impressed that they don't ever stop. You cannot buy or sell options pre-market in Canada. True. Very true. You cannot. Um, futures, though, you can. Uh, right, Louisa, just be careful there, of course, with whatever you're buying. You have to come to your own conclusions on that. I never tell you what to do or not. You've got call options on TQQ. Okay, I'm not a huge fan of leverage options on leverage funds. Um, I'd hedge it. I'd always hedge every trade. Um, but yeah, okay. Is trading pre-market exceptionally not great? Yeah, I don't know. I don't normally trade pre-market. I very very thin volumes and and a lot of madness. Uh, so yeah, you'd have to be that kind of day trader who makes trades every couple of minutes. That's not me. I, I like to, uh, you know, go and do things with my life. I don't like to stare at screens all day long. But this is the pre-market here as we see it right here, right now. Um, Microsoft up a third of a percent. Apple up 0.1 percent. Tesla up 1.4 percent. Amazon up 0.4 percent. On the Tesla front, there is again some options positioning and jam that might imply that markets or that Tesla has an upside risk. Uh, but again, that's not a not a buying recommendation in any way, shape, or form. I hold no Tesla, and nor do I intend to. Um, I forgot to take my probiotics again. That's not a plug. 
let me see if there are any other questions that I missed here. PayPal, PayPal, I think just hitting another low, right? PayPal is just, used to be my biggest position. Um, and again this morning, uh, staggering. Um, I don't really know why, to be honest with you. I think it's a, personally think it's a great business. That doesn't mean you should buy it. Uh, because I thought it was a great business when it was worth <laughs> an extra $100. Um, but yeah, there, there we are. Um, I own most of my PayPal through a fund. Um, I haven't seen them sell any of it or at least put that out. Uh, so I suspect I probably have been buying PayPal the last quarter as well. Uh, Elon, yeah, Elon did tweet that he's not going to sell in at least uh, the next 12 to 18 months or so, though Elon... Well, he does change his mind, doesn't he? But yeah, at least for the moment, that's going to be uh, good for the stock price. Uh, Alejandro, you're you're roughly right. Delta and probability isn't exactly the same thing, but it's it's pretty closely correlated. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's it's a fair metric if you haven't got the probability in your brokerage. Although if you don't, you really should change brokerage. Um, first, I have to find that trades break even though, right? Yes, you do, Mike. Um, option strat is free, so you could use that. Um, that's that's probably what, what, what I would do. Um, I mean, I, I don't think anybody wants to calculate options trades anymore. It seems like, you know, we're born in the 70s or something. Um, right. Any any other questions, guys? Uh, feel free to shout them out. Uh, futures are now looking distinctly green. Uh, let's have a look at the extended hours on stocks. Mullen is up. Oh, good God. Uh, Baidu up, Tesla up 1.2%, GameStop up 1%, Ride is up. Uh, this is really not good, is it? Why do I say that? Because when all the junk floats to the top, and I don't include Tesla in that, um, but Mullen and Ride and, and things like that, uh, Beyond Meat and in, 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 in all of these stocks, it's just like, it's kind of exuberance, which is what we don't want. We want like a calmer, more more rational market, really. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm moving, moving my phone here for you guys on Instagram. Uh, so, yeah, Etsy up a third of a percent, Amazon up a quarter, Polestar up a quarter, Blackstone recovering a little bit, Nike flat, QQQ up 0.09% now. So it's not really doing very much. Uh, and I think a lot of that is really just got to do with um, the massive options expirations we have here, 3835. It's a, it's like a magnet. It keeps sucking us back down. Uh, so it's kind of looking like not a lot's going to happen here. <laughs> That's kind of the way it's looking. Uh, unless people wake up when they go to the office uh, in, in half an hour and, and, and the market really starts flying. But at the moment, it's not looking that way. Volumes are petering out here. Um, Sean, your surname is Mullen. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Would have been great if there was a brilliant company, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> you guys tease me with Mullen. Uh, never bought a share of it in my life. Um, um, yeah, uh, Mullen to the moon. Crikey. Andrea, that is very, very, very generous of you. Is and that's the best thing to do with the profits to donate it to a dog shelter. The the, the dogs thank you. I heard Winston race in about half an hour, ten minutes ago, um, from the forest. Um, might change my surname, says Sean. Well, there is a there is a distinct likelihood that Mullen's um, lifespan might be a lot shorter than yours, Sean. So I would just sit it out, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, Mullen indeed, uh, zero point three or something like that. It's it's just. I, I, I think this is just junk, to be honest with you. It's a trading at 24 cents. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I wouldn't bother. I wouldn't bother at all. QQQ, on the other hand, is flat now. Given up most of its gains pre-market again, keeps getting sucked down to sort of 265 or, or thereabouts. What are you getting Winston for Christmas, says Jim. That's a very good question. What would Winston like for Christmas? Actually, I'm going to get him a snow jacket because that's the plan. He's never seen snow before because he's a tropical hound. He's uh, born in Hong Kong. That's where we adopted him. So he's only ever seen beaches and heat and that kind of thing. So it'd be really funny to see him in the snow. But he gets cold because he doesn't really have like the real golden retriever fur. He's very fluffy, but he's actually, well, he's a tropical creature, I suppose, his 
parentage, whatever that might have been, uh, was uh, was tropical as well. So yeah, I'm going to get him a get him a ski jacket. So that'd be quite sweet. I'll, I'll post some pictures when he wears that. Um, and other than that, I think um, cucumbers and celery are, are his, his preferred vegetable. <laughs> That's actually how you make him happiest. If you open the the vegetable drawer, he comes and sits there, and he's all like excited. So yes, vegetables for Winston. Um, Robert, you saw your first Rivian truck, oh, Amazon truck, passed by your house yesterday. Interesting. Uh, how many has Amazon picked up of those? Do we do we know? Um, are you adding Tesla before bounce? I don't own any Tesla, Oleg. Um, the trade is starting to look interesting, but I, I haven't. Um, I don't think I will because the market liquidity is, is so appalling. But if you look at... This is Tesla chart. And if you look at, say, RSI, it's, let me make that a little bit bigger for you. So this down here is, when you're below this dotted line, you are in the oversold area, right? I mean, you, you, you can be oversold for weeks and months even, but we are really oversold. I mean, we put a red line in that and see if we've ever been this oversold before on Tesla. Yeah, at one point in um, June 2019, um, let's pop a line in there and have a look what it did then. Of course, past performance and all that isn't a guarantee, you know, that kind of thing. And we were also there at one point here in 2016. So let's have a look at those two spots, although that in itself should not determine whether or not you're going to trade this. So. If you bought Tesla at that point and held it for, um, say, a month, you would have made 41% return on that one. That's not too shabby. Um, that was 2016. Of course, you have to take into account macro and all of that. And then in 2019, if you've done the same thing, bought it there, held it for 31 days, uh, you would have made a 26% return. So history makes this look rather appealing. Um, but I say, no, in this environment, so, such low volume, it might be worth looking at. Um, have to have a look at what the volatility, the, the implied volatility should be pretty high, right? It should be pretty high. Um, I don't know. When are earnings? Earnings are 25th of Jan. It's starting to look appealing, but it's also a falling knife. You see, I'm not usually a fan of falling knife trades. And this is this is very, very, very much a falling knife. There's a little indicator here called Weinstein or something, right? Then they have that, Weinstein. Um, does that give us that? No, that's not it. But anyway, any, any, any old buy signal that you could possibly find is going gonna, is gonna to tell you that it's it's a sell at this point. Massive volume yesterday, the sell-off. So yeah, for the brave, um, I'm not that brave with trading. I like I like a statistical edge. I don't really like the, uh, that's good, you know, that kind of thing. Um, my dog refuses to wear a coat, even here in New England, Cole, but he's probably used to it, Jim. He's probably got really, really nice, thick fur. Um, mine is like used to 90 degree heat and 90% humidity and, uh, and, uh, and, and thinks that that's quite pleasant really. He sleeps in the sunshine, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and Glitch, I agree with you. And I've done that. I, I, I haven't given him anything. I've never had given him a coat or you see, you see dogs here with the raincoats, which is just amusing. I think, um, you know, we go hiking every weekend and it's like, it's been like, five, eight, 10 degrees Celsius up in the mountains. And, and that's good. He's fine with that because he's moving. But when you stop, when he sits down, he gets cold and he curls up and he's like, I'm cold. So um, if I take him out to a cafe or something, I bring him a blanket. So he lies on the blanket because the floor's too cold. So I'm, I'm not thinking for like everyday life, but say we are sitting in a ski chalet in the snow, um, you know, nibbling on something and he's going to be lying in the snow. I think he'll get really too cold. So I have to get him something for that. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Uh, so yeah, you know, enough of golden retrievers. Um, ah, Mike, iron, iron condors. Iron condors are two credit spreads, nothing else. So just treat one side as a credit spread, the other side as a credit spread, and then you have two break even points. You work out the probability for each. Um, and then you've got to deduct the 
outliers basically. So it's a, it becomes like a curve and you lose the sides. That's, that's basically all, all of this. So it's a little bit more irritating to calculate, Mike. I get that. Uh, but yeah, that's basically the way that works. Um, what have you joined? All right, I'll do a recap in just a second here. Um, very few stocks that aren't falling knives. True. Very true. That's a good point. Um, how are the numbers? Late white, uh, waking up due to the holidays, Toronto. What is it? Already the holidays? It's the day before the holidays. Okay, let me do a quick recap. I'll show you what the numbers were uh, this morning. So inflation, PCE inflation came in lower than expected. Yay. Sorry to make you feel slightly seasick by moving this around so much. But yeah, this is the this is the key data today that we got. So there is in, uh, in, in, in wonderfully small, the PCE price index, 0.1% up only. We're expecting 0.2%. So this is wonderful. Core PCE at 0.2, basically as we expected, but it's still lower than last month. So it's still, still good news. Personal spending lower than expected, which means that pesky US consumer that's allegedly driven GDP prices, um, GDP growth up so much last quarter is finally um, slowing down, wielding their plastic, which is a good thing for the stock market in the short term. It, of course, also screams recession, but that's another story. The personal income number is what dampens the mood a little bit here at 0.4 percent. That's like eh, eh, it's a pretty big negative. Why? It just implies that the wage spiral is becoming potentially a real thing. It's a little higher than we were expecting. So not wonderful. And then also a lot more recessions indicators here from the durable goods orders just going, going down, like really going down. So that again implies recession. So I would think that this was positive. The market initially disagreed with me and then it sort of caught up with me and then it's now disagreeing with me again. And why is it doing that? Because of, this is a rather messy chart, isn't it? How do we get onto this chart? Is the put wall still there? I'm not sure. I think it's probably moved a little bit lower. Uh, let's go on a on a minute chart here for a moment. Uh, so, yeah, we're kind of bobbing around here, and, and really the main reason for that, I think, is where the options are positioned at three eight thirty five. So, I think the upward reaction was the rational one, but the market gets keeps getting sucked down to three eight thirty five, which is where um, J P Morgan is doing its best to manipulate markets. Well, to hedge, uh, that's what they call it. Um, how about a bear call spread on the Tesla? So you're bearish on it. Yeah, I mean, it becomes a directional move, Marcus, unless you can position it sufficiently above the market. I think that's really what I would say. Just watch out for that. There are some option trades in, in Jan expiring that could give Tesla a bit of a nudge up. So be a little bit careful with that, that one. Uh, that's what I would say. Um, Coinbase is looking good at these levels. I haven't looked at their last numbers. What were their, what's their profitability? They used to have a 100% gross margin, which even got me excited, it almost got me to buy it, but I didn't because I thought it was too correlated with Bitcoin. Uh, the question now is, of course, what margins can they produce in this kind of a crypto environment, right? Um, Buy a straddle and sell one side before the total of the straddle is in the money. Jim. Complicated. That's what I would call that. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm generally a fan of closing out trades in entirety. I very rarely like close out only one side of it. Um, yeah, only if, again, volumes are really low and you get stuck in it. Um, but that's why it's in my opinion, better not to trade this 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 month at all because I don't think that's really worth doing. So, uh, markets, yeah, this is pre market, not that exciting. As a tester up zero point seven percent, we'll be losing our morning exuberance here before it's even got started. So we're looking back to kind of a bit of a miserable day. If we break below three seven seven five, by the way, um, just turn off your brokerage and enjoy Christmas because it could get really really ugly below that. Um, so far, um, it cannot go more lower, or like, oh, everything can always go lower. Um, and I, I, I think you know, I, I'm quite a fan of SoFi 
especially their CEO. Um, but it is a growth stock. The market hates growth stocks. Uh, it is therefore rate sensitive, uh, at least perceived to be. And this thing has gone down. Hang on, how much has it gone down by? You know, it's gone down 80%. Does that mean it can't go down another 80%? No, it doesn't mean that. Everything can keep going down as much as it wants to. Um, seems to be some bottoming out here, but we've done that before in the $5 range. We've done a similar thing in the $5.50 range. So, yeah, uh, very long-term horizon and, 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 and small allocation, I think, is the key to being a happy growth investor. Uh, all a bit confusing indeed. PCE was bullish. The market is acting like it missed it. Um, I think that wage growth number is possibly the uh, the fly in the soup. And um, nobody likes flies in their soup, right? It's, it's a fairly significant one. So yeah, there we go. Um, Teddy keeps buying um, SoFi. Okay, just make sure your position sizing doesn't get out of hand. That's what I would always say. Like this falling in love with stocks thing, which... I don't really know who came up with that. Was it ARC or something? The whole conviction thing. I've always hated the word conviction. I think the only conviction you should have is a positive P&L. The only conviction you should have is to make more money. And I really couldn't care less what stock I make the money with. Uh, so I, I never really understand this sort of blind falling in love with a particular stock. I just don't really get it. And it seems like for Tesla, for example, it seems people are even more in love with the stock than with the product. I meet a lot of people who have Teslas and they're like, yeah, great car, like it. But they're not that excited by it. You meet people who hold Tesla stock, they're like, I mean, it's like puppy love, right? First love in high school, completely besotted with a thing. Um, don't do that. That's really what I would say. Like always try to be um, rational and, 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 and try to be um, open to being wrong because um, we're mostly wrong. And I'm just um, working on a, and a whole series of lectures on uh, on mindset for our our more advanced option students, and and really just makes me realize making money is actually all about mindset. The whole trading thing is about mindset, and and if you get into that, like I fell in love with this, and therefore I'll stick with this forever thing. Very very hard to make money. A conviction to risk management, yeah, that's a, a James, um, a man after my my uh, my heart. Um, wage growth should be expected to lag the CPI and PCE. Should it? Wage growth is also November. This is all November data. I don't know how they how they compute that, but you might know something that I don't. Thoughts on the durable goods report on the market? Well, people who make durable goods, like car companies, for example, yeah, watch out. Uh, the X transport numbers are up which means that transport was a significant drag on durable goods orders. So car sales are definitely falling. Teddy, I love that you invest bi-weekly. Honestly, if you can invest weekly, even better. The, the more frequently, the better. Just make sure you're investing in, in, in good stuff. Um, <laughs> Danzo, I like that. Um, Google buying NFL for $2 billion? Really? Most of the things that Google buy, they shut down. Seriously. Spend like $50 billion or something on buying companies and that they then... They just disappear into Google world somehow. Strategy, possibly. Um, maybe they just gobble up the smart employees and the smart idea and then they shut it down so nobody competes with them. I kind of think that's been their strategy. I'm sure they wouldn't admit to that. But that sort of seems to be the, the strategy. So if you look at what's going on this morning, yeah, it's not looking quite as green and rosy as we'd expect it to be from the QQQ numbers. Uh, sorry, the PCE inflation numbers, which is the Fed's favorite inflation metric. We are now down 0.07% here on the QQQ. Um, what would I encourage you to do today? Well, first of all, wrap some Christmas presents. Makes people happy. And uh, secondly, very, very important, sign up for our free masterclass on the 27th. I'll be slaving for hours over Christmas to prepare it. Uh, it's for five-figure-plus investors. And um, I'll explain the beginning of the 
masterclass why I limited to five figure plus investors because you can do some different things if you have a little bit more capital if you are only just getting started it's also amazing brilliant check out felixrenzelog slash options down below check out our options course uh, so the google graveyard indeed um Oh, they bought the TV rights, says Donna. Oh, okay. Okay. I didn't buy the whole NFL then. <laughs> Could have done. You never know. Uh, maybe Elon will buy it. Um, right, guys. I wish you a beautiful, happy Christmas. If I don't see you before then, should you decide not to tune in to this YouTube channel before, I probably won't do any lives before Christmas after this, unless something you know dramatic happens, which we hope won't. And um, think about how you make 2023 a better year than 2022. And I did say that at the beginning of 2022. So it's a bit of an I told you so. But seriously, like you have to learn to be in control and really understand markets and your money. Uh, that's where your financial freedom and your real life freedom comes from. It's not from working. It's not from a salary. Your salary should be dwarfed by the income from your assets. And I know that takes a bit of time to get there, but you need to have that plan to get there. And if it's just a sort of wishy-washy idea in, in the distance, it'll never happen. Trust me. Uh, so set those targets. Use a little bit of that time over the holidays to make some plans of what you really like your life to look like. Uh, is it sitting in that cubicle or driving to work for hours every day? Probably not. Uh, in which case, write down what you don't want to happen next year and then write next to it, make another column what you would actually like, which will be the opposite of those things. And um, if you want any help, with how you get to those targets, give us a ring, uh, felixfriends.org slash call down below. Always super happy to talk to you and, and, and see how, if, if we and how we can help to get you to your, um, your financial targets and financial freedom. And uh, happy Christmas. Thank you very much for tuning in.